Hi, I'm Diane McGarry with Drake at Arts. And I'm Tom McGarry. With us today is our March event flute player, Hawk Henrys. He's a member of a name of a band of the Nipmuc tribe, which I can't pronounce. Can you pronounce that for me? Chabanagongamog. Chabanagongamog. That's, That's such very a close. <laughs> incredible word. <laughs> and where does that come from? So uh, it comes from our language. Well, and, yes. bas and basically it um, makes reference to an agreement that Nipmuc people had amongst themselves to not encroach upon each other's fishing space. That's so uh, the, your name is basically a treaty. More or less, an agreement, yes. Wow, that's cool. So your band of the Nipmuc people, which are an indigenous people who dwell in Southern New England. Correct. Um, you've been composing original flute music and making flutes using hand tools and fire for 30 years, that's amazing. Your hawk is committed to music as a traditional art form and as a vehicle for building bridges of communication and mutual respect. He teaches and performs in a wide variety of settings, indigenous and international art festivals, museums, concert venues, powwows, and educational settings. As a flute maker, he focuses to remain historically consistent in terms of the relationship to and the process of building a flute. That I want to hear more about. Hawk has performed at Smithsonian Natural Museum of American Indians, the New Orleans Jazz and uh, Heritage Festival, Harvard Medical School graduation, and with the Boston, um, sorry, with the London Mozart players. Wow, that's incredible. And that's because Hawk is an incredible flautist. I am so excited to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us, Hawk. Thanks so much for having me. Happy Can to you be talk here. a little bit about how you became a native uh, flute player? Uh, sure. Um, let's see, where should I begin with this? Um, I think about, oh, maybe 33 years ago, I, I decided that I needed to um, have music in my life, you know, as a, as a, a performing art, we'll say. Uh, and uh, as a youngster, I tried a few different instruments and didn't feel like I had success with them. So I gave them up. And um, but uh, a number of years ago, I was listening to flute music and it, it just struck something deep inside of me. It made me feel like that's the instrument that I needed to spend some time with. And so after a number of years of uh, searching for them, I, I did a little bit of whining, uh, which is always uh, helpful when you need something. Uh, my, my family gifted me my first flute and uh, it, it exploded, if you will, from there. Um, had you been playing uh, another instrument? Uh, no, I didn't play anything else uh, prior <laughs> to that. Um, you know, my my introduction to the flute and and when it came into my my home um, uh, caused a lot of frustration for me. I would listen to uh, other people's flute music and uh, try to replicate that on my uh, on the flute that I had. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I. I thought seriously about just putting the flute down and my wife uh, you know shared some wisdom with me which was um, that I shouldn't try to play other people's music <laughs> that I should play my own and when she said that to me I thought she was you know maybe um, losing her mind or something because I had I had no music and she oh, said of course knew you, you better do. I think so um, <laughs> she said of course you do just don't don't try to play other people's play your own so I, I had to think about what that actually meant and um, my desire, uh, Diane, was to use music as a form of uh, prayer. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so what, playing my own music meant expressing things that I felt in, in non-musical things. Um, right, you know, right. my love for this earth and my, my hopes and desires for healthy relationships between cultures and between peoples, things of that nature. And uh, the flute was just going to be a, a vehicle, uh, a tool to express that with. And, um, you know, in, in thinking about that, uh, her, her words of encouragement were just probably some of the greatest words that anyone could have ever uh, said to me. So. so it's like you see music as an ambassador. Oh, without doubt, without doubt. Um, you know, after the flute came into my life, a number of other instruments began to kind of show themselves. And uh, I noticed that most of these instruments were very uh, old 
instruments from old cultures around the world. Uh, and my, my interest with them is one, to learn about the cultures that they come from mm -hmm. so that when I present them to people, I can talk a little bit about the culture rather than just um, asserting my own musical creative self on it. I, I really want people to know about these old cultures. And one of the things that um, is so obvious is that uh, if we look far enough back at all of the cultures in the world, we have so many commonalities. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just that we've forgotten the, that common thread that weaves its way through all of us um, and that causes the, the strife that we have with each other. So, so the, the instruments themselves are absolutely uh, uh, ambassadors, as you said. That's cool. cool. It's almost like, well, the truth is that I wouldn't want to just eat strawberries, right? Mm -hmm. I also want blueberries and peaches and apples. And it's the same thing. There's as much diversity as fruit and vegetables as there are in peoples. And sometimes we forget the value of that diversity, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's probably seems like a silly metaphor, but it's a very simple one. Well, I use I usually use M and M's, so I like your idea of fruit. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because all M and M's are all shaped different. the same. Right? Well, uh, but they're different colors, and they're just as sweet and just as delicious. M and M's are, but I I love your idea of uh, using fruit as a metaphor. So I may have to steal that from you <laughs> anytime. <laughs> <laughs> so you also make flutes correct so you yes. make the flutes that you play yes i do um so after that uh, my family my wife and my dad gave me my first flute about two months or so after uh it was given to me i thought i could improve the sound of it <laughs> and i knew <laughs> i knew absolutely nothing about how these instruments worked yeah. um so it literally in in about five minutes uh the uh, you know with my effort to improve it I ruined it. And yeah, stopped. that's um, the first thing I thought of. Our son is very creative sometimes too, and he'd probably get mad if he heard this. But as a little child, he would want to improve things. Actually, we did rocketry with him, and oh, he tried so many incredible things to mm -hmm. shoot as rockets that just made no sense. But if you are starting in the beginning of a process for anything, you have to start with that wonderful friend called failure. Absolutely. I, so I love that. I always encourage people to make as many mistakes in their life as possible. And, yeah. and, and then to look, to look at those mistakes and gather knowledge from that and gather, you know, whatever you can from it. And it's so beneficial in our lives, I think. With, with regards to my flute, uh, after five minutes, it didn't play. And being the person that I am, kind of stubborn, uh, <laughs> thick-headed. I decided, well, I, I need to make it work again because I, I knew that they wouldn't give me another one. And um, plus I, I, I just felt the need to understand how this instrument worked. Uh -huh. So for the next six months, I worked on it, uh, wow. you know, whenever I could. And it literally took six months for it to play again. And from that uh, no, uh, experience, I gathered the knowledge of the, the mechanics of how this instrument works. And I applied it to new materials. And that's uh, how I began my flute making journey. So your flutes are not metal. They're wooden. Correct. Yes, they're wood. So how do you use the fire? Um, so the, the process for uh, building a flute, uh, for me, I use a brace and a bit, which is an, a, a very old woodworking tool. Um, the, the bit is about 17 inches long. It's a drill bit. And the device that holds it and that allows you to turn it is called a brace. Mm -hmm. um, so once I bore out the, the piece of wood, uh, then I use a draw knife and a block plane to do the shaping, the exterior shaping. Um, once the flute is shaped, uh, I use uh, old metal uh, rat tail files. They're um, oh, yeah. uh, uh, tapered files and I heat them in fire. And I use those to burn all of the little finger holes and the sound mechanisms and the mouth, the, the, the mouthpiece end. Um, so what kind of wood do you like to use? Uh, Diane, I use pretty much all woods as long as they're not uh, extremely toxic and um, with one exception, uh, oak is a wood that I don't really use too much for flutes, um, uh, primarily because I like to see it as a tree, but I don't care for it in furniture, flooring, or anything else. So, Do I the different woods have different sounds, different resonances? 
different resonances. Sounds, um, let, let me back up a little bit. So some, some flute makers would suggest that the broad family of hardwoods and softwoods would, um, will, will provide or um, create a different kind of voice in the flute. My experience has been, and my opinion is, that how the flute maker makes the flute and the type of finish that they put on it um, uh, determines the, the final voicing of the flute. That being said, each wood uh, resonates differently. Mm -hmm. So if we were to have um, two almost identical flutes, one being, uh, let's say, you, the other one being a soft pine or cedar. You is a softwood as well, but it's a harder softwood. Um, how those vibrate would be considerably different. And uh, I think that resonance can be felt by the, the musician, the person who's playing it, and then sometimes by a very sensitive listener. Well, our biggest <laughs> organ is our skin. And Correct. our skin is just the same as a drum, right? It vibrates, it gets the vibrations. Absolutely. I, I was uh, uh, at an event and I had a didgeridoo, I, I play that as well. And I was playing at my table and a young man uh, was walking by my table. He may have been about 20 or 30 feet away from the table, but when he felt the didgeridoo, and I'm kind of making a face because he was profoundly deaf. And he oh, wow. felt the didgeridoo and he stopped and began dancing and expressing uh, oh. what it was that he was feeling. His parents brought him closer to the table uh, and I continued to play for him and he was just ecstatic. His parents literally, they wept. Oh. Um, and they said that they hadn't seen him uh, respond to sounds like that. Uh, oh. um, this young man was probably in his early twenties uh, ever. And, uh, but it was, as you said, his his body, his skin that was sensing the vibrations from the instrument, and it That's it was crazy. it was incredible. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> so let me see. I'm trying to. F I have um, a few recordings of you that I'd like to share, and. I apologize, we're first gonna get the little screen before I can make it big, because that's the only way I can share it, but I'm looking forward to hearing you play. Oh no. That's amazing. 
Thank you. Thank you. Oh gosh. That that piece of music. Uh, I I know you didn't ask this question, so you can stop me. But uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, some some years ago, my family and I were invited to England uh, as part of their. They were commemorating John Smith and the um, John John Smith Pocahontas. That kind of um, story, we'll say, commemorating him, and. Uh, we were invited, I was invited to visit some uh, academic institutions and, and share a little bit of my perspective about things. Um, prior to our trip there, uh, I was contacted by the London Mozart players and they invited me to uh, create a piece of music to play with them in concert. Oh, wow. And so this was a very long story. So I'll, 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 I'll cut a whole lot of it out and make it brief. Um, my initial response was to say no. Uh, hmm. One, because the flute, the flute traditionally is used um, by itself. It's not played with any other instruments. Hmm. Uh, but secondarily, and probably more importantly, was that I was petrified. I had, I had done a little Google search, and it, it turns out that the London Mozart players were the premier uh, classical orchestra of Europe at the time. Oh, yes. Wow. And I, I thought, oh, there's no way I could do it. You were intimidated. To say the oh, absolutely, I was more than intimidated. Um, so anyway, uh, eventually I consented. After my wife and our daughters, they they uh, they said to me, you know, Dad, if uh, if you go there and it's horrible, no one's ever going to know. So we'll come back home and we won't say anything. So I, you know, I thought that was a great a great way to look at it. And uh, I composed this piece of music that was eight minutes long to play with this orchestra. There's a lot of this story that I'm leaving out because we could speak for a half an hour or more about it, but it was that experience. Imagine playing um, in these 900,000 to 1,000 year old stone churches in the countryside of England with this incredible orchestra. It, it, um, it was an experience that, that had a profound effect on me as a person not, oh, yes, not even just as a musician, but just as a person. And those spaces are built for the echoes of the sound, for the reverb. Oh, they are. Oh they my they God. definitely yeah. are. Um, I, I came home prior to that experience. I, I had no interest whatsoever in any type of music that could be considered classical music. Huh. Once I came home, I couldn't hear enough of it, which is where my, my uh, obsession with uh, Baroque and other early musics uh, huh. arose. I've, I've actually been a... Um, an exhibitor at the Boston Early Music Festival. I don't know if you know uh, early music, yes. uh, but that's like the world, you know, premier uh, mm. festival of early music. But I've been an exhibitor there, oh. uh, which was great. Mm -hmm. I was the first native flute player maker to to be a part of that event. How wonderful! But, oh, it was wonderful. That yeah, was really cool. Yeah, that's really neat. I have um, colleagues who from. The conservatory, when they graduated, they went to Germany to sing Gregorian chants in the yeah. old cathedrals that were built in the shape of a cross. And they talked about hearing the chants and all the overtones because the yes. buildings were built so you could hear all the overtones and the pieces. Yes. I can't even imagine that. It's just how rich, what a rich, rich depth that adds to all the pieces and Absolutely. to our understanding as people, right? I mean, I sing all the time. That's my instrument. And I'll just mm -hmm. go walking through the woods singing, but it doesn't reverberate anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you sing, you play your flute with the birds outside. It, it's you and the birds. So it's, you know, it's a whole different. Right. It different sure is. It's a whole different experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Well, let me find another one here. If, um, so I have to bring them up and then I can make them big screen. I apologize for that, but that's, that's the okay. Do, do, do. And this one, I can't really make big screen, so.
Now you told us that you did that to give someone an example of the voice. Correct. Of an instrument you made for them. Yes. Can you explain what you mean? I mean, I know what you mean, because, but can you explain to like people like my husband, who's not a musician, what that means? No, I can't. <laughs> uh, you know, some, some, I, I think of the, the, the voice of uh, any instrument really as um, a combination of both the auditory things that you might hear, how it makes you feel. So it's, it, that's a really difficult question, Diane. Um, it's, I think it's more than what you're hearing. It's, It's almost the soul of the instrument. Uh, sure, that that absolutely <laughs> sure. Yeah, um, and and I'll say that you know there are times I've had two flutes on the table that, for all intents and purposes, had the had a very similar voice to them, a very similar sound. Uh -huh. um, you know, they were they were tuned almost exactly the same, and um, and yet one would appeal to one person more than it did to another person. Huh. And I, I, I think besides anything uh, tactile or visual, uh, besides what you're hearing, um, what you're hearing with your ears, I should say, I think that there are other, other aspects of ourselves that gather mm, input from a, a musical instrument, a, a person's voice, the sound of the wind or the birds. And I think as you can see, I'm I'm stammering here with uh, with an explanation, but it's just the the sum of so many different things that um, that is the voice of the flute. Uh, so let me ask you this: when you're when someone asks you for a flute or you decide to make a flute, how do you choose how long the flute will be, how big it will be, and what particular wood? Do you try to, do you think of it in terms of the person? What thank would you for, that person? Thank you for that question. You know, as many interviews as I've done, I think it's the first time anyone's ever asked me that question. Really? It makes yes. sense. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, one of the things that, that, when I'm building a flute for someone, we very seldom talk about music. In fact, it's usually at the at the very end of whatever discussion that we might have uh, we we might be having. Um, if they if they want, we'll talk about you know any kind of musical things that should be uh, thought about with the flute. I like to spend as much time as possible getting to know who this person is, who the flute will be for, what um, motivates them in life, what their work is, what their just what their life is about, uh, uh -huh. and. Um, and usually when I'm having this discussion with a person, um, uh, it sounds maybe strange, but images of, you know, maybe trees or birds or other things might, might uh, present themselves and uh, they inform the choices that I make. Uh -huh. um, of course, there are some very physical things that need to be considered. Making a gigantic bass flute for someone who's you know, who has very small hands might not be the, the best thing for them. Right. But, um, you know, listening to a person's voice, the cadence, how they speak, um, uh, all of these things inform my choices when I'm building a flute for them. Mm -hmm. Usually when I've reached, the, you know, some kind of tentative conclusions about the type of wood, the, um, the voicing of the flute, whether it's going to be high pitch or low pitch or somewhere in between, um, the, the, physical uh, attributes of the flute usually I, I mentioned you know I'll, I'll share that with the person just to be sure that I'm somewhere in the ballpark and um, and uh, usually you know they say oh it sounds wonderful please do that mm. now historically uh, the flute makers uh, a flute maker would live in obviously within the community and um, if a person were to ask the flute maker to build a flute for them the flute maker would build the flute based on their knowledge of that person because they live in close proximity with each other. They oh. knew each other um, well. Um, that you know is a little bit more difficult, uh, particularly if you're making flutes for people from various places around the world. So discussions uh, are really helpful in that regard. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. So you have this one interesting 
um, almost silly flute that I want to show. And it's not, it's not silly in that the instrument is silly. It's just, we don't usually think of, of flutes being like this. Um, mm -hmm. And that's this nose flute that you have here. <laughs> Wow. So tell us a little bit about a nose flute. I have time for one more song. Whoops. Sure. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> Hold on. Tell me a little bit about what a nose flute is, because we've seen you with a small flute, which yeah, the nose flute is, here, and then, oh, dear, 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 dear. dear. Uh, <laughs> and I have goofed somewhere in here. Um, sorry about that, guys and the bigger flute that you were playing earlier. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, you know, there are, um, the nose flute itself, the one that I was playing comes from Hawaii. It's a traditional Hawaiian flute. Mm -hmm. There are um, similar instruments uh, in uh, many places in that, that part of the world, uh, Polynesia, Indonesia, I'm trying to think of other places, but there, there are many different um, forms of the nose flute. My understanding is that uh, that flute is um, traditionally used for prayer. And the thinking behind it is that uh, the cleanest air that comes from your body, comes from our body, comes from our nose. It's filtered as it's coming out. Um, and the thinking is that, the, you know, if you're going to use a flute for prayer, then the cleanest air possible um, should go into it. And uh, according to the the person who gave it to me she said that there are so many profane things that come from our mouths it's hard to uh, to imagine using that as prayer um i i loved it because it uh when i first when i was first given that flute it um it was probably the most uncomfortable instrument ever for me to play uh you know the idea of sticking something underneath my nose and then block the right nostril. yeah you had to block one nostril and then get it angled just right and then I joke, but it's it's a serious concern that if you have a cold or if you haven't, know. you know, blown your nose before you use it, then it could be really disastrous. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was pretty uncomfortable. But uh, I, I I love what it does for people because it I think um, it it kind of shatters uh, their concepts if they haven't experienced it of what a flute should be, hmm. what a flute is supposed hmm. to be, and how you're supposed to play the flute. Um, and I think that it then uh, opens uh, a door to discussion about shoulds and shouldn'ts and, you know, the differences in the world. And as you well know, you've heard me say it enough times already, I'm, I'm a believer that uh, the differences that we, that we all bring to the world is what has the potential for making the world a beautiful and healthy place. If we were all exactly the same, it would be sterile and we couldn't live. No, everyone would want to go out with my husband. I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. I have one other personal question, and I hope you don't mind me asking. Not this. at all. You have this beautiful hawk that you generally wear. I know. I was surprised. Oh, no. <laughs> Can we redo this whole thing all over again? <laughs> but on every time you've I've, every other time I've seen you, you have this beautiful hawk, and of course that's your name. Where did your name and and this beautiful piece that you carry with you come from? So hawk is only a, a small part of my name. Um, there's there's much more to it, and maybe when we meet in person, I can tell you more about that. Um, but it's uh, it's the name that my family gave me. Uh, so simple answer, but that's that's it in a nutshell. The piece that I wear, uh, I've had that for. I think about 25 or 26 years and uh, we were at an art show and I was just kind of wandering around uh, during a quiet time and stopped in one man's booth 
and he had all different kinds of artwork, but one little glass case mm -hmm. with one of a kind bone bird carvings. Oh. Uh, it immediately got my attention and I looked and I saw the one that I, I have now. And I asked him, uh, I told him, I said, I'd love to buy that. What's the cost of it? And he said, it's not for sale. It kind of, you know, mm. hurt. He was just really short with it. It's not for sale. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's peculiar. But so I walked away and I went back later uh, that same day, a couple more times, a couple more times that weekend. And he, you know, uh, I was met with the same uh, answer. It's not for sale. Well, over the next three years, I saw this man several times a year at different art shows, and I would always check his glass case just to be sure. Mm -hmm. And that piece was always in there, and I always would ask, and he would always say the same thing, it's not for sale, it's not for sale. And uh, the third year, uh, it was the, the outdoor art show season was winding down, and I saw him and looked in the case, and I asked the question. It became routine for us, you know. I asked the question and, uh, and he replied, it's not for sale. And um, later that day, as my, my wife and I, we were packing our belongings, he, he walked over to the table, my table, and with his arm outstretched, uh, clasping something in his hand. And, uh, and he held it out to me, so I opened my hand and he put that piece in my hand. Oh. And, I, and I looked and uh, I, I didn't know what to say. Um, he said, it's, it's been yours the whole time. Oh so I, I, I literally, I sat there and I wept, oh uh, and I put it on and I've been wearing it. Um, I've been wearing it happily, proudly ever since wow. I have, I, I, he's since then, he's given me a couple more of his birds and uh, I've given them away. Uh, I think his work is so amazing and special that I, I just want everybody to see it. So I, except for that piece that I have. I'm not going to give that one away. But uh, all the other ones I've given away. I gave one to a man uh, last two, last year or the year before last, we had uh, visitors from Siberia and Mongolia. And uh, there was um, one of the elders who was there really admired the piece that I had on. And I had a very similar one. So I gave that one to him. And now oh. he wears that. He was from Mongolia. Wow. He wears that. So um, that's, that's where that piece comes from. Well, that's great. Wow. Yeah. I'm so yeah, touched. Yeah. So please. Tom, what did you say? What a great story. So oh, thank, thank you. you for yeah. telling us. Oh, you're yeah. welcome. I hate to cut this short now because I love talking to you, but we need to go. So please join us, everyone, on Saturday, March 19th at 4 p.m. for Hawk Henry's On the Flute. And we will have this on YouTube and Dragon Arts YouTube. Look us up and enjoy. Thank you so much for being with us, Hawk. This has been- Oh, it's my pleasure. I really loved it. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Tom.